Hi, my name is Chaplain Christina Montel, and I am with Carrier Air Wing 7, stationed at Naval Air Station Oceana in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And this is Stepping Off the Brow, a show for sailors and military-connected civilians where we look at life's issues on both sides of the ship's brow. So whether you are stepping off the brow to come to work, stepping off the brow to come home, or you're waiting for someone to step off the brow to come home to you, this show is for you. More importantly, during this time of COVID-19 and all things Navy life, we wanted to introduce you to people and their stories that can give you strength for today and a bright hope for tomorrow. Today, our guest is Lieutenant Dylan Kelly. Lieutenant Kelly currently serves as a pilot with Helicopter C Combat Squadron 5 out of Naval Station, Norfolk, Virginia. Dylan's story about his memories from his earliest memories from when he wanted to be a Navy pilot. And getting to that point is one of a story of just joys and highs and lows and struggles. But what is really unique about Dylan's story and his journey to become a Navy pilot is one that inspires with his strength of character and the hope that he finds from his work. I hope you enjoy his story. I think um, you mentioned earlier, or there was there was the part where you talked about, hey, I stuck my head into the chaplain's office and he wasn't there at that particular time. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think there was, um, and you talked about some friends locally who are in the muck and the mire with you. Um, they kind of get what's going on with at least flight school. Um, can you speak a little to how you found yourself like you're in this really dark place and um, I don't want to say, how is it that you found yourself in a place where you were at least felt like you could at least voice those, what was going on? Like where, who helped you to give voice to that? So um, I did have, one of my best friends that I've, <laughs> I met in sixth grade and we found each other uh, in flight school at the exact same time in the exact same flight school class uh, by happenstance. Um, she was, uh, she was in the same IFS class that I was. And so we were taking tests at the same time. And we, because of that, we were studying together and we kept regular, we talked to each other often and hung out. And, uh, I think because she was actually there, she could see the, the, um, the nonverbal cues, um, where I was just a big ball of, of nervousness and anxiety. <laughs> um, and so she was the one that kind of encouraged me to talk to the chaplain um, for whatever she understood or did not understand what was going to happen or what was happening with me. She she wanted me to go talk to somebody about this. Um, and so that was the she was the encouraging one for the, the the first the first time. And I didn't see the chaplain. And then we we took this this test at the same time um, and when I came out of that test, I was still this just like wreck. Um, I was, the stress was just eating me alive at that point. And she saw me and she said, you know, try, try the chaplain again. And so um, the chaplain's office happened to be right across the hall from where we took this test. And so I had to walk past it to go take the stairs down and to leave the building. And so as we're all walking past, um, I stuck my head in there and uh, the RP said, hey, sir, yeah, the chaplain's in, come on in. And he's, no, he's not seeing anybody at that time. And so I stuck my head in and um, introduced myself to, to his chaplain and uh, he could tell right away that, that something was off. And so he pulled me into his office and he started to ask questions like what's, what's going on. Um, and so I started talking about all of these, these issues that started happening. Um, it started off like, very light like I, i'm just really stressed right now very vague i didn't want to disclose a whole lot um and i think he caught on to that pretty quickly because then he he started talking about how the chaplains have this this confidentiality clause where anything we talk about uh won't leave that room um and it, it legally cannot no matter what i told him um he brought up some some dark examples but I was, it kind of drove the point across. And so I started opening up um, a little bit more to him about what was going on. And I think uh, the, I remember the, um, the one thing that was really getting to me is when I moved down to Florida, um, I brought my personal firearm. Uh, I have a Remington 1911 that I kept in my 
nightstand. And when I started having these dark thoughts, it always kind of reached back for that handgun. Um, and it got to the point where I was afraid to touch the handgun. I was afraid to even open the drawer and look at it. And so I started telling him about that. And as I would imagine anybody, he was he was really shocked and taken aback. And he started talking about how he wanted me to to go seek professional help. And this is where I started disclosing. I was like, I, I don't, I'm afraid to, because I've worked so hard to be here. Uh, my entire life has been working to find myself here in Pensacola to achieve this dream of being a pilot. And I was, I don't want to lose that. I'm afraid to lose that. Um, and so we talked for a while and he was staying with me and he said, after letting me talk and being able to open up some more, he said, listen, I'm going to go talk to the skipper of schools command and I'm going to, I won't say your name. I'm not going to tell him what's happening, but I'm just going to ask him the question. You know, if somebody's having these thoughts of suicide, can they get the help that they need and still continue here? And we talked a little bit more and I, I said, sure, like, don't mention my name, but if you want to have that conversation, it's not a threat to me, I guess, at this point. And so he, he left me with his RP and he walked down, he walked right into the skipper's office, like almost unannounced and asked that question. And the skipper was right away like, no, absolutely. Like we will keep, we want to keep these sailors alive, but we're not going to use that against them. We want them to, to continue. Dylan, to Dylan, okay. can, can I, can I pause for a second? Because yeah. You know, there's this there's this moment where he leaves the room and you're sitting there, and I, and I'm wondering as you're sitting there, what are you thinking in that moment, as he's no longer with you? At that moment, I was thinking, what's going to happen next? Um, I was there was a thought of I could leave right now, um, but I didn't want to leave right now. There was it was like a combination of fear and relief fear because I was afraid what was going to happen next yeah. this belief that I was actually able to talk to somebody about what was happening. And they sat there and listened to me and they were, they were doing whatever they could to, to try and get me help. Um, so that relief, oh, man, that, that relief, I, you, dude, when you just put those two together, that idea of fear, but relief, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> it was, I, I wasn't expecting it either. I, I, I honestly had no idea what to expect when I walked into the chaplain's office. It was my first time ever walking into a chaplain's office. And I'm, I don't, I'm not like a, I don't go to church myself. Like I don't, I don't actively participate in religion. Um, so it was kind of the original thought was almost off putting. Um, but being able to sit there and talk to them, it changed my entire understanding, at least at that moment of, of what I can talk to this person about. Mm -hmm. Um, so in that, I think that relief is what kept me in that chair until he came back. Um, cause he did come back after 10, 15 minutes. And he said, this is, this is exactly word for word, what he told me. Mm -hmm. And we had the discussion. He was like, listen, I, I can sit here and talk to you all day, but what I really want to do is I want to walk you to the flight surgeon. And I want you to tell the flight surgeon everything you're telling me so we can, we can get you help because I think you, you could use it. You could, it would help you. Um, and so there was, I remember being quiet for a while as I was kind of like weighing my options at that point. Um, but after talking with him, I agreed and he walked with me. We walked over to the flight surgeon and I sat down with this flight surgeon and I kind of did the, abridged but the same story that I was just telling the chaplain and the chaplain kind of walked me through everything that I had told him and helped me tell the flight surgeon what was going on um and so at that point the flight surgeon was like yeah let's get you help right now mm -hmm. um and so at that point they the um, chaplain uh and the flight surgeon together they got me to a mental health hospital down in Pensacola um Baptist, I believe was the name of the hospital. We checked in and I started a, like, um, it, I guess it was the safety that aspect of keeping me safe is what was happening. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. the, I remember my chaplain with the flight surgeon, uh, had a roommate at the time that contacted my roommate and said, Hey man, like go into his room, get his gun, put it somewhere where he can't get to it and know that your friend is not coming home tonight. He's going to be at the hospital. You can go see him, but he, he's, He's, we're trying to keep him safe right now. 
Um, so I was at that hospital for six or seven days. And I remember it was, that was the, with everything at that point, that time in the hospital for me was the most difficult because I was coming to the realization that this was no longer a secret for me. Like this was no longer my personal struggle. This is now, this was becoming a team effort and I wasn't entirely comfortable with the fact of bringing a team in. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, your experience of, of, of being um, in the hospital, you know, so you said it, it, it no longer became just your, your story, but you're bringing all these other people into it. Can you tell us like, what are the people that kind of helped you through that and kind of helped to build that team to get you to the point of where, you know, eventually you're going to be, you know, discharged, but, but what did that look like? Um, so I was checked into the hospital. Uh, Florida has this thing called the Baker Act, and that was what was used to put me in the hospital. Um, and so originally it was going to be for about three days, but because of, of some timing and some other issues, they, they extended out to seven days, essentially. Um, so I checked in, I believe it was a Tuesday that I checked into the hospital. And um, during that time, uh, Chaps from Schools Command was there every single day. He he came and visited me every single day to kind of talk to me, make sure I was doing okay, make sure I had everything that I needed. Um, and it, it kept me sane. Uh, that was the first part to keep me sane. Uh, Cause when you, when they hospitalized me, they took away everything. Um, I couldn't have my cell phone. Um, they took away the shoelaces on my shoes. Uh, so I was just, I was walking around in this weird khaki uniform because I couldn't have my top anymore and I couldn't have my belt. So I had my khaki pants, this white shirt and these shoes without any laces. Um, So I felt really, really odd. Um, But during that time, they started doing the evaluations. And so I saw um, a few specialists at the hospital who were kind of talking to me to try and find out what was going on. Where did this, this all stem from? And I started talking about my story, how... At VMI, I started with this, I had this struggle with uh, my friend who committed suicide um, and then everything else that was going on in my life. Uh, and during that time, so I saw the, 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 there was, I think, two different specialists that I talked to um, that were kind of helping me out. But I think that there was two people that I was at the hospital um, who were the most influential that were not part of the Navy. Um, and the first one was a nurse that I talked to. He was, I think he was German or Belgium, um, but he had like this really heavy accent and he saw me hanging out one day. I was sitting there playing with a bunch of Jenga blocks because there's not a whole lot we could do while we're hanging out there. So I was just playing with these Jenga blocks, doing some some nonsense. And he came and sat down with me and he was just, I had a, just started this casual conversation, like what's going on, how are you doing? And I don't know why, but I started opening up to him too. And I just started talking about everything that was going on. And at that point, my friend was on my mind and I started talking about him and how a lot of, or his decision didn't make sense to me, but kind of made sense to me. And so it was a pretty long conversation, but I remember the the one thing that he said that kind of stuck with me is the people that you think are most put together are the people that have the hardest time getting help. Um, Not that they're more susceptible to these thoughts or any more than the people who are having um, other crisis in their life. But when these, these people that you look at in admiration and you say, man, I want to be like that guy, those guys that are admired have a hard time reaching out for help because of that admiration because that that thought process like why do you have these thoughts like your life is great what's what's there to be upset about um and i remember sitting there thinking about it and it, it kind of put a new perspective for me on that and the, the conversation came up again with with robin williams and that same that same aspect you know a very famous actor who was renowned and loved all of a sudden made this decision and it couldn't make sense why and again it goes back to i guess at least my perspective of or this perspective i learned that you know these people have the hardest time reaching out for help because of that stigma 
that, and they're afraid of that stigma because there are people who are having serious issues in their life. And why do I have anything to be upset about? Or do I have anything to, to have these thoughts? Like I'm doing just fine comparatively. Um, why do I need help? I don't want to take that help away from somebody else who really needs it kind of thought. Um, so it was that, and then, uh, that, that really stuck with me. And then I had a, a random encounter with, um, with another patient at the hospital, actually. Um, I remember we were just talking about nonsense and this was a very charismatic gentleman. Uh, he was there for some drug related behavior. Um, so nothing suicide related. He was caught doing some stuff that he shouldn't be doing. And I remember him talking to me and we were talking about my, my experiences. And he said, man, you got to look at that person and realize you have no idea what they're going through. You have no idea what that person's lives and that experiences of that person is. You, you don't know anybody other than yourself. Wow. And that person can tell you their entire story, but it will, even if they told you from start to finish, you still cannot understand what that person went through because those experiences impacted them differently. Mm-hmm. And I remember sitting there, I was like, it was such a meaningful impact. And my second thought I was like, that is the greatest thing a drug dealer or drug drug has ever told me. And that's <laughs> going to stick with me for the rest of my life. But it, it, I guess it goes back to that, what he just said. Like, I don't know what that person went through. I don't know what he went through, but he just gave me this, this, insight that I would have probably glossed over um, unless he had put it into words for me to hear. Um, So again, I I just changed those two encounters really kind of helped shape how I received treatment from there on. Cause those, those two were the things that I kept going back to whenever I started talking to people about what my experiences were Mm -hmm. and what, why I felt found myself in this, situation so dylan um so you're you're kind of going through that that week-long process and you you, you kind of got these competing voices you're hearing in, in one sense the, the voices that are in front of you are, are very helpful then you have the other voices in your mind that sounds like you're kind of anticipating the stigma um maybe even a little guilt a little shame um yes is, is that part of what um, you're kind of anticipating uh, those on the outside would have. Yeah, I was, I was, there was a lot going on, uh, from when I left the hospital to starting up my, my treatment plan that a lot I was expecting to happen and that I guess didn't really happen. So like that, that stigma that you're talking about, I was afraid of for sure. Um, again, this the thought that I want to continue on with my dream that I still, I'm in Pensacola in a hospital and I can see out the window, the planes flying and I want to, I want to go back there. I want to continue on where I left off. Um, and I'm afraid I still have that fear that I'm not going to be able to. So Um, what was it like then when you walk into those places, either, you know, the, the offices, the classrooms, the buildings, uh, apartments and you're now around back around those people. Like, what was that like initially? Initially it was hard. Um, I was, I was envious of those that were continuing on. Um, when I came back, I started my treatment with, uh, NAMI had developed this plan for me to, to get back. Um, and I was seeing some professionals and then I kept regular, um, meetings with the chaplain and he was kind of helping me navigate this, but going, um, during my during that time, uh, while I was getting help, they had given me a job at Schools Command. So I was one of the ensigns that worked at Schools Command, and I was well, it was almost like spiteful because I was now working at getting all of these students to from check in to their first aviation command, and I was helping them get there. But I myself was stuck in this limbo at the time. Um, trying to work through my my recovery, work through my treatment. Um, so at first it was difficult and seeing everyone continue to go past and continue on with their, their pipeline. Um, but then I started just to become, I guess, more comfortable with, I am, I am working towards getting there. Uh, I will get there eventually. My timeline's a little bit off, but 
I I believe at that point that I was I was going to make it back. Um, this kind of ties back into one of the things at VMI. I had a we all get these class rings at VMI, and you can engrave something in them. And while I was at VMI, one of the things that a friend of mine told me is, um, if you don't fight, you can't win. And that kind of came up in conversation with one of the chaplains uh, with the chaplain, excuse me, while I was receiving my treatment. And that's kind of what I stuck with. Um, and that's what kind of the thing that I fell back to every time I started having these these envious thoughts or these spiteful thoughts. I was like, I'm I'm working there. I'm continuing my fight. I I want to be back there. I'm gonna get myself better. I'm gonna get myself healthy, but I'm gonna get back and achieve this dream of getting into the cockpit and flying for the Navy. So can you give us um, how long, so you you were at the very beginning of flight school and then all of this happened. Um, what is kind of, what was sort of the timeline of which got you back on track uh, to, and, and what did that look like? Um, you know, uh, how you kind of progressed along that path to getting back to, to in the cockpit and flying and then becoming, um, and then actually doing uh, the job as a Navy pilot. Um, so the Navy came up with a, a treatment plan um, for me. And essentially what that was is I go through my treatment plan and during my time, I'm not going to worry about schoolwork. They're going to give me a job where I'm working at the school's command. So I have access to school's command if I want the resources to prepare for aviation. Um, so uh, I was released from the hospital and school's command uh, gave me a job at school's command. So I had access to those resources um, to help prepare for the aviation pipeline. I had access to the instructors and the materials, but at that time I was not actively in a class. I was going through my treatment plan and just working for the school's command. Mm -hmm. um, so I went and I went through my treatment. I saw my pro the professionals and they all helped me. And then I kept regular interviews up with the chaplain to kind of keep me going, um, to help me, uh, Get healthy. Yeah, essentially get healthy. Um, Cause the, the professionals were focusing on like the very specifics and the chaplain was very focused on, I guess me as a person mm -hmm. and, and helping me deal with the stuff that the Navy um, like recognized, but were focused on other aspects of it. Um, so the chaplain kind of closed it all together for me. Um, so uh, I was released in the hospital uh, November of 2014. And then I went through my treatment plan and uh, um, then the aviation process, I had to get through a waiver to verify that the treatment was successful. And then um, from, so from the t that time until I completed um, IFS and API, it was about 13 months. So I graduated API in October of 2015. API is? Uh, aviation pre-flight indoctrination. So, um, when I was, I got my approval from NAMI to continue in the aviation pipeline. And it was like, I remember walking into uh, medical down in, in Pensacola and the flight surgeon who, the flight surgeon who sent me to the hospital was the one who gave me the, the news that I had been approved to continue in the pipeline. And he was like, as soon as he saw the waiver, he said, come with me, like, we're gonna walk right now. I'm gonna walk this up and we're gonna get your, your up chin right now. And so he walked, he walked me around the, um, the medical place and was like almost, I remember one of the, um, the other flight surgeons like, Hey, remember that guy I was talking about? This is him. He's, he's up for full duty. We're, we're sending him back. And yes. he was like parading me around essentially. <laughs> uh, it's quite the opposite so, uh, of guilt and shame. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was pretty excited. I was, uh, yeah. so he got my up chit and then I went back over to school's command and school's command was thrilled to hear it. Uh, mm -hmm. So they put me at like the top of the list for IFS. And then when I graduated IFS, they put me at the top of the list for API. Um, I remember my very first flight in the aircraft and IFS was one of the greatest feelings of my life that I, I made it. I'm, I'm here. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going through it. Um, so then I, I finished up API in October of 2015. And then uh, from there, I was sent up to Milton, uh, VT3 Red Knights. And so I learned to fly the mighty T6 there and the red Knights at that time were, were hammering students through the syllabus. And so I got there pretty quick um, and finished pretty quickly. And it was, uh, it was an absolute blast. It was still stressful. There was still a lot of stuff going on. Um, uh, not for me, but like 
a lot of um, the learning process, I guess. Mm -hmm. It's not that they were they, they weren't treating you with kid gloves. They were treating you like every other student, and you still had to meet all the same standards. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as really, after I left Pensacola, as soon as I graduated API, when they sent me up to uh, Trailing Five, uh, Trailing Five had no knowledge of anything that happened in the past, and so they just they pushed me through the syllabus by sheer luck. I got put to VT three. Um, and that just worked out in my favor because I finished that syllabus real quick. Um, and then they, uh, from there, I selected HTs, uh, helicopters. I remember that day, I was like, this is another step closer of uh, achieving the dream of Navy medevac uh, when I got selected for Rotary. I was, again, over the moon thrilled. Um, it's the top so of then... the world as you know it, <laughs> and I feel fine. <laughs> so. so then they sent me up to uh, HT-28, uh, the Hellions. Um, and then from there, I uh, continued on, uh, selected HSC in Norfolk uh, after however long it took me to get through HS, uh, HT, excuse me. Uh, and then from Norfolk, I finished my HSC syllabus over at two and was sent to HSC five, where I met them on deployment. Uh, so I got to fly into Bahrain and then met them <laughs> in the Gulf of Oman and got to experience right in the middle of what the, an actual Navy deployment feels like. And so my, my first flight and those commands were playing guard out in the goo. So <laughs> some, some people might seem like, uh, whatever, it's like whatever flight, but I was from everything that I had to go through to get there. It was, it felt amazing. And, and I think one of the things to remember is that while you were going through deployment, uh, your son was born while you were on deployment, right? Yeah. So, um, right, uh, right before I, I guess not right before I left early or in the middle of my syllabus over at HSC two, uh, my wife uh, discovered that she was pregnant. So we were, we were excited. And then uh, we found out that the due date was going to be in October timeframe of 2019. And I was being sent out in July of 2019. So uh, remember I was out in the, we we're out in the Gulf of Oman and I was checking my email in September. Uh, four o'clock in the morning, getting ready for uh, one of our launches, and I get an email from my wife saying, "Hey, call me." And uh, she never, she never asked me to call her. Like, highly unusual. That was all the email said, and so I was a little bit concerned. So I immediately called her, and she told me that our son had been born that day. And so I was just like overwhelmed <laughs> <laughs> on deployment to know that um, our son had been born a little bit early, but he's perfectly happy, healthy baby. If you if you were talking to two different audiences and you had like 30 seconds for each audience. <laughs> and so you got a person who is struggling. They're in that spiral and they ask, they ask you for your perspective. What do you say to them? I say that when I was in that struggle, I remember the, the, the most difficult thing for me, was to start that conversation. Um, and it was hard for the people around me to understand that that conversation needed to start. Um, and so finding anybody uh, for me was that chaplain that I could start that conversation with because as that conversation started, there was that, that relief that everything started getting, started to feel better. Um, it was once once that conversation started, everything started to come together. The the, the help I I needed started to come. The the understanding of what was happening in my mind started to be pieced together. Mm -hmm. um, being able to to actually word what was going on in my mind and have somebody listen to me um, and kind of give me feedback to what I'm saying or ask questions to help un help not only them understand but help me understand what was happening. Mm -hmm. Now, starting that conversation, however you can, however possible, I think is is the most important step. Start the conversation with someone. That's that's so good. Okay, so now, same thing, same scenario, but this time you're talking to people who may know someone who's spiraling or they're concerned someone is spiraling. What do you say to them? I, so I would say that the same thing. When I was in that situation, starting that conversation – was was in, almost impossible and 
my friend encouraging me to go talk to someone to start that conversation for whatever, if she was not comfortable starting that conversation, but she knew somebody who could um, was, was what made the world a difference. And if you are, if you can start the conversation, then, then do it. Like, don't wait for them to start. Don't wait for, I, people might've been waiting for me to start, but I couldn't do it. However much I wanted to, however much I tried, it took me a, my, the encouragement of my friend to go see a chaplain and that chaplain to kind of push the subject for me to start opening up. And once that started everything, that's where everything started to, to go forward and nothing will go forward until somebody starts that conversation. And it's hard for the person in that to it's, you can't expect them to, to be able to, because maybe they don't know how to. Be great. So Dylan, thank you so much for sharing your story. This has just been a really great um, opportunity to just sort of hear, uh, I don't want to say, just, just one of those stories of hope and strength in the midst of, you know, just what, what was a, a tough time, but to see where you're at now, it's such a, such a sense of just, you know, kind of what the tagline says is strength for today and hope for tomorrow. So thank you so much for, for doing that with us. And I feel like you've really given us that strength to, uh, to fight. Because like you said, if you don't fight, you can't win. Uh, and that strength to uh, start the conversation, either for ourselves or for somebody else. Yeah. Thanks, Dylan. I hope that it helps anybody that needs it. Um, I remember I just, all I wanted was help. And being mm -hmm. able to listen to someone talk was, or being able to talk myself was, again, the, the best thing. So. Mm -hmm. Our theme music is the song Josie O by Jamie Stone. The views and opinions expressed are those of the hosts or guests and not the United States Navy. You can subscribe to Stepping Off the Brow wherever you find your favorite podcast. And of course, please feel free to share this with your shipmates, friends, or family. See you next week.